at Fraggle Rock. Good morning, everyone. Dance your cares away. Worries for another day. Let the music play down at Fraggle Rock. Fraggle Rock was a children's musical fantasy comedy puppet television series. That's a lot of uh, ad adjectives. Uh, about interconnected societies of Muppet creatures, and it aired in the 1980s, and it's back. Fraggle Rock is on Apple TV. You can see all of the old uh, Fraggle episodes, and they even have uh, some new ones that they just came out this year. So the Fraggles aren't going anywhere. If you don't know the Fraggles, I suggest you Fraggle out a little bit. <laughs> Believe me, they're on YouTube. I've been watching nothing but Fraggles for the last few weeks. And I realized something. They really have a lot to say. Fraggle Rock was HBO's first foray into original programming. And as such, it was, quote, critical to the network's development and that's according to uh, the network's executive vice president of corporate communications, Quentin Schaefer, who also uh, worked on the original Fraggle Rock press team. The audience followed the antics and adventures of Gobo, Moki, Wembley, Boober, and Red, the group of Fraggles, who meet many other creatures uh, as they explore the world in which they live. As they uh, explore their world and read about in uh, outer space from postcards that uh, they get from uh, Gobo's uncle, Flying Matt, where he describes the silly aliens, which are the human beings that live out in the world, um, the Fraggles must interact with Gorgs, which is a race of giant creatures that are led by the king and queen of the universe. Uh, and the Doozers, a tiny race of Muppets uh, that are very skilled laborers. Uh, they're always constructing something that seems to benefit the Fraggles. Uh, in order to build an entire whole community between the three races of puppet characters, the Fraggles are guided by words of wisdom and clarity from their all-knowing trash heap. Marjorie. Marjorie, who announces in the very first episode her identity of all, when she states, I am orange peels, I am coffee grounds, I am wisdom. Uh, and I would like to share a little bit of Marjorie with you right now. And I know what this fraggle has. Well, of course you do. You're all knowing. I know that. This young Fraggle has trouble. Troubles. Troubles? I'm bringing you my troubles. I'm sorry. Sorry? What's to be sorry? Trouble's my favorite thing. When I was just a little bit of trash heap, Mama told me, child, there's something you should know.
me your pain. Give me my I promised my uncle I'd visit a certain place every week, and now there's a terrible monster living there. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I don't know. I, that's what I heard whenever I heard Marjorie. Every time, or every one I meet, they make my life complete. Give me your pain, give me your troubles, give me your woes. That's what Marjorie said. The Fraggles may be the title character of the show, but it is Marjorie, I believe, that is the representation, the embodiment of Christ's directions that we find in Scripture. It is Marjorie that takes on the weight of the Fraggles' worries, and it is Marjorie who directs the group of, uh, of Fraggles to befriend and to love the Gorgs and the Doozers. So what is the show really about? What, what the show is about is about people getting along with other people. It's about the understanding the delicate balances of our natural world. These are the topics that can be dealt with in a symbolic way, which is what the puppets basically do all the time. These are two of the areas that children and our generations that are growing up right now that are dealing with. Um, in the seventh episode of Jim Henson's popular Muppet-based series, the trash heap composes a poem about compost, garbage, and her rat-like sidekicks, Philo and Gunge. Um, touched by her comparison of them, to rotten rinds, they comment that they never knew she had it in her. As she laughs and sinks back down into her restive state, Marjorie, a name known only by her companion, Rats, they call her Marjorie, whereas uh, the Fraggles call her uh, Mrs. Trash Heap. They refer to her with a symbolic gesture of uh, submissive, sub submission. They have respect. The trash heap is the medium of Henson's intention that this show will teach children about taking care of each other and the natural world. There is something in her for every group in Henson's wacky universe. The trash heap offers wisdom to the fraggles, compost to the gorgs, who use her for their garden, and nurturing to Philo and Gunge, and a wonderful combination of insight and hilarity for all of the audience. Her humor and wisdom, a blend of mystic and earth-centered knowledge, are offered in speech and song. The songs uh, range in style from American uh, blues to Caribbean calypso to multi multicultural ballads. In one of the few critical studies of Henson's work, Sidney Dobrin argues that the Muppets are deeply ecologically conscious group. That Henson's projects deliberately promote ecological thinking and ecological literacy. And that with Fraggle Rock, Henson also intended his young viewers to learn how to live in harmony with all of the world, not only people. The trash heap is the matrix of ecological literacy Henson promotes. Literally rooted in the earth, the trash heap absorbs all the garbage and pain brought to her. As the spiritual center of the universe, she takes in everything from the gorg's table scraps to the fraggle's fears and gives back to them a vision of healed relationships and a healthy world. Marjorie does indeed have everything in her. She teaches us about social and environmental justice through her unique combination of transformative prophecy, environmental sustainability, wisdom concerning interspecies connections. <clears throat> it is through the direction and teachings of Marjorie that Fraggle Rock seeks to fulfill Henson's goals to help children envision a better world. 
something he thought would bring peace to the world, an end to war. In the 80s, he thought this show was going to heal the world. In a book titled Jim Henson's Fraggle Rock, The Ultimate Visual History, we are told that Jim Henson had always been known for his desire to leave the world in a better place than he found it. And Fraggle Rock was the perfect vehicle to bring out his interactivism. The world of Fraggle Rock would be populated by the different races of all mutually dependent on one another, albeit unknowingly. Over the course of the series, the species would become aware of their interdependency and learn the importance of resolving the conflicts that arise between them and recognize that their diversity is beneficial to all. Jim Henson was born in 1936 and he spent the earliest of his years in, uh, on this planet in the state of Mississippi, surrounded by intolerance and conflict of race. His son, Brian, believes that his backdrop, that it was this backdrop that influenced his father's philosophy, which was less about tribal loyalty and more about wanting to bring people together. Brian believes that it was this, the intolerance that Henson experienced in his formative years that inspired his work later in life. In the 40s, Henson's family moved to the suburbs of D.C. where he fell in love with television. And the rest is history. But because of the success of his earlier works, most notably Sesame Street and, and The Muppet Show, Henson realized the extent of his global reach. The wonderful thing about creating television for children is that by making them aware, giving them a positive image of what the world can be, and showing them that they can make a difference, you can affect a kind of social change. And it's not just for today, it's for the future. In a later season, in an episode titled, The Preachification of Convincing John, it's not Marjorie, but Moki, who sings a song to us titled, Why? It's a wonderful song that includes a slight variation on our scripture from today. It's the golden rule. But rather than saying, treat others the way you would want to be treated, it talks about treating others the way they would want to be treated. This made me think, what if other people don't want to be treated the way that I want to be treated? Maybe I should listen to them when they tell me how they want to be treated. It's a, just a slight difference in the way we look at, at these, this message from Jesus. The so-called golden rule is not Jesus's creation. It appears in positive, do unto others, and negative, do not do, uh, forms in Hellenistic literature, Her Herodotus, uh, Isocrates, um, as well in Jewish, uh, Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, uh, and Hellenistic Jewish texts, uh, Tobin, Sirach, Sir Sirach, I said that wrong, it's not Sriracha, that is a type of hot sauce. It also appears in subsequent rabbinic writings and other religious traditions. Some claim that it is a universal ethic with, uh, which expresses the wish of all people to be treated with decency and justice. While that may be so, it does not adequately express its meaning in the context at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus says these things. Jesus' vision of an alternative way of life uh, is referenced here. The reference to the law and the prophets recalls Matthew 5, 17. In verse 12, it encases the middle section of, oh, I've got a lot of notes here to go back and read a lot of stuff. If you'd like to know where it says some things, I can help, find, uh, help you find those. But earlier in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is giving all these instructions. This, this is not separate from those. This is the conclusion of, the, of that text. A literal translation highlights the significant construction uh, at the beginning of the verse. Everything, therefore, whatever it may be that you wish to, that people do to you. The therefore connects the verse to Jesus' teaching that preceded it. The everything that you wish people to do to you is not a blank check in, that the audience can fill in uh, for any selfish or destructive living 
the content of everything is circumscribed by the context of Jesus' teaching in the sermon about a way of life that embodies God's gracious, transforming, indiscriminate, loving, generous, and good empire. It's written, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. How does this perfect way of life come about? So thus do to them. Do refers uh, to a way of life. The pronoun them refers to people. A term that names non-disciples previously in Matthew. So the audience is to live its distinct identity and lifestyle as a community of disciples. Shaped by God's empire and articulated by the Sermon on the Mount. In order to influence others to encounter God's empire and to live accordingly. The verse states an ethical principle which sums up the whole sermon and provides direction for discerning how to live in all sorts of situations. The final clause for this is the law and the prophets recalls Jesus' claim in 517 to fulfill the law and prophets. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. In his teachings and actions, Jesus lives out what the scriptures proclaim as the will of God. He provides the definitive interpretation of the scriptures as 521 through 48, for instance, is demonstrated. I'm not going to read that entire section. This refers to his teaching. Uh, this refers to his teaching of a way of life in God's empire marked by an indiscriminate love for all, which is faithful to the scriptures. Disciples live this life, but they have been warned in the Sermon on the Mount that the imperial and synagogal powers will not always welcome their alternative structures and practices. Disciples live a lifestyle that is out of step with the res resistant, or out of step with and resistant to Rome's uh, imperial ways. In these different circumstances, they must remain focused on God's empire, strengthened not only by the words of Jesus and the disciplines of prayer and fasting, but also by one another. As I conclude the message this morning, I would like us to bring us back to the Fraggles. In season four, episode six, the characters of Henson's Fraggle world come together and sing a song that I would like to bring us to close with. It is this song, Children of Tomorrow, that brings us to our own awareness of our call from Jesus to love one another as we love ourselves. Full of mystery. I have seen so many faces that were strange. And I sometimes seemed that each one was my enemy. And I said our fighting ways would never change. But I learned to meet my brother and my enemy. And I learned that we are none of us alone. For I found a friend who's different and he cares for me And I know a place we share can be our home We are the children of tomorrow Each one is different and the same Help us to live here forever Our brother, one in heart, one in hope Children of tomorrow. Wonderful. Each one is different and the same. Help us to live here with our other, our brother, one in heart, one in hope, one in.
They get it. Be a fraggle. <laughs>